but she's resistant to the purely instrumental thinking that has come to dominate the AI industry. She works at the intersection of feminism, technology studies, participatory design, um, human-computer interaction, militarism, and demilitarization. And I and many others are indebted to her for her very precise explanations of how AI systems work that puncture the myth of their autonomy. Along, or, along with her many um, academic publications, interviews, and podcasts, you can also read her blogs at Robot Futures. And her talk today is on absent presences in military imaginaries of AI-enabled warfighting. War yeah, so I want to thank Teresa for the invitation to be here in such good company. Um, and I'm going to be continuing uh, some of the themes that Paris and Elke set up this morning about dominant narratives um, that frame the way we think about AI. I'm going to continue talking about the military and war fighting. I apologize for that. Um, and I want to explain that this is going to be rather U.S. centric um, because it's coming out of my position as a U.S. citizen um, with a very long-standing concern about my country's role uh, as the overwhelmingly largest military force uh, on the face of the earth. Um, so with that preface. Um, so my contribution to our discussion is part of an ongoing project that I'm working on at the moment of tracking 21st century militarism's continued commitments to a closed world, and I'll say more about what I mean by that, and to the marginalization or erasure of the constitutive outsides of the machine that militarism imagines itself to be. I want to develop the idea, inspired by our workshop theme, that making life absent is crucial to the machine's operation, not only in the obvious sense of killing those who are its targets, but as an enabling condition of militarism's sustaining imaginaries. The erasure of liveliness is central to the military imaginary, rendering always potentially unruly persons inside the machine as disciplined operators and dehumanizing those who are its justificatory threats. The, this diagram, um, what we might call following M. Murphy a phantasmogram, could say more about that, of the current U.S. Department of Defense project of Joint All-Domain Command and Control, or JADC2, is emblematic, and I'm going to come back to it for a closer reading. As Leonard Cohen reminds us in the lyrics to Anthem, there is a crack in everything, and that's where the light gets in. While the apparatuses of militarism are pervasive, their closure is never complete. The question then is how the absent presences that haunt the military machine can be amplified as a contribution to wider collective efforts to interrupt the operations of colonial violence and to expand spaces for reparation and justice. The reference to absent presences in the title of my talk cites the body of scholarship sometimes gathered under the heading of hauntology, described by media and cultural theorist Lisa Blackman this way. Hauntology is a method that engages with displaced and submerged narratives, actors, agents, and entities that primarily exist as an absent presence. In different ways, they exert influences that exceed specific practices of visualization and representation. Moving beyond big data analytics, hauntologies address the social and cultural lives and afterlives of data, revealing gaps, dead ends, erasures, foreclosures, and epistemic uncertainties. These practices attune to what is rendered visible and invisible, material and immaterial, and true or false within particular regimes of visibility and truth-telling. As one more context-setting citation before I get into the darker realms of my talk, let me offer these uplifting words on intelligence in the absence of life by Dutch computer scientist Edsger Dijkstra, who coined the phrase structured programming. 
writing on computational metaphors of learning several decades ago in a way that applies equally to so-called machine learning in the present moment. So Dijkstra writes, a serious byproduct of the tendency to talk about machines in anthropomorphic terms is the companion phenomenon of talking about people in mechanistic terminology. The critical reading of articles about computer-assisted learning leaves you no option. In the eyes of their authors, the educational process is simply reduced to a caricature, something like the building up of conditional reflexes. For these educationists, Pavlov's dog <coughs> adequately captures the essence of mankind. While I can assure you from intimate observations that it only captures a minute fraction of what is involved in being a dog. My opening reference to militarism's continued, so just sort of keep that dog in mind as we go. My opening reference to militarism's continued commitments to a closed world, as many of you will recognize, is a reference to Paul Edwards' brilliant book of that title, in which Edwards describes the techno-political imaginary that underwrote the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union at the end of the 20th century, now updated to the US v. China. Set against this imperial standoff is an anti-colonial imaginary named by anthropologists de la Cadena and Blazer, a world of many worlds. This follows calls by indigenous leaders, most famously the Zapatista in Chiapas, Mexico, for, in their words, a world where many worlds fit. We could take these as two aspirational approaches to global security, one based on containment, economic supremacy, and military domination, the other on negotiated coexistence. In my current project, I'm interested in following the relevance of closed and open world thinking to questions of US militarism and data. My starting premise is that data-driven approaches to security, particularly those promoted under the sign of AI, require closed worlds for their operation, and that understanding that requirement can help to clarify militarism's limits. Orit Halburn summarizes the history of the techno-political imaginary that animates the closed world in her book, Beautiful Data, as, as the quote, aspiration for the perfect and unadulterated transmission of information as control of the future within a self-referential and contained space. The extension of the containment project of nuclear deterrence, which is the the period that, that Edwards was writing about to war fighting on the ground can be traced back to US operations in Vietnam, and Elke referred to that this morning, articulated in 1969 by General William Westmoreland, then Chief of Staff of the US Army, who offered these thoughts over lunch, quote, on the battlefield of the future, enemy forces will be located, tracked, and targeted almost instantaneously through the use of data links, computer-assisted intelligence evaluation, and automated fire control. I see battlefields on which we can destroy anything we locate through instant communications and the almost instantaneous application of highly lethal firepower. With cooperative effort, no more than 10 years should separate us from the automated battlefield. While the US effort to implement this fantasy in Vietnam, Operation Igloo White was an infamous failure the fantasy lives on with the holy grail of data-driven omniscience and weapon systems automation as its beating heart. The closed world of data-driven warf driven warfighting aims to materialize what Michel Foucault characterized as the 17th century dream of, quote, a sign system that linked all knowledge to a language and sought to replace all languages with a system of artificial symbols and operations of a logical nature. End quote. Conjoining socio-technologies of mapping, surveillance, categorization, and enumeration, military intelligence rests on an infrastructure of data platforms whose interfaces promise privileged access to warfighting's world. In a self-referential cybernetic loop, this techno-political imaginary enacts a world in which that which escapes datification no longer counts. The current instantiation of the Foucauldian sign system has its roots in mid 20th century information processing psychology. This conceptualization of military cognition, a lifeless diagram equally translatable to persons or systems, 
has been institutionalized as the canonical observe, orient, decide, and act, or OODA loop, first set out in the mid-1990s by U.S. Air Force Colonel John Boyd in a series of DOD briefing papers. Most relevant for my analysis is not so much the figure as the white space in which it appears. And that's a problem I'll come back to shortly. The model is elaborated in a recent rereading of Boyd by his associate Chet Richards. Richards emphasizes that despite the common depiction, Boyd never actually figured his conception of the loop as a sequential or circular course of action. In a much more cybernetic model, Boyd rediagrams the OODA loop uh, as shown here and offers this reading focused on the critical phase of observation and orientation. He writes, the entire orientation bubble, uh, oops, excuse me, over scrolled here. The, the entire orientation bubble, including the blocks and all of the interactions between them, represents our mental models of reality that are making predictions about the effects of our actions. The observation bubble includes all the ways we bring in information from the external world as well as about our own bodies and minds. So datification on this model will require the translation of those arrowed objects labeled, quotes, unfolding circumstances, outside information, and unfolding interaction with environment into computationally legible signals that will control the conduct of war. Again, the bounded units of the diagram's bubbles and the white spaces in which it floats at once presume and artfully dodge the question of relations between the figure and its ground. Since the 1990s, the OODA sequence has continued to serve as a normative model of what in common military parlance is called situational awareness, promoted most industriously by Mika Ensley, former chief scientist of the United States Air Force. <coughs> situational awareness is defined by Ensley as, quote, the perception of environmental elements and events with respect to time or space, the comprehension of their meaning, and the projection of their future states. It's all very simple. A connecting thread across these cybernetic models is an objectivist epistemology well suited to the elision of signals, data, and information. The white space is the world out there that presents itself to military agents who act. There's a presumption that relevant entities and events will be detectable to various sensors. The problems that arise are framed in terms of insufficiencies in the number of signals and the amount of data available, along with the speed of its transmission and processing, rather than with anything more fundamental about how military knowledge systems make their worlds. So I'm particularly interested in how ideas of situational awareness enact the boundaries and the relations between the inside of the military machine and its constitutive outsides. And that brings us back to our phantasmogram, figure one from the DOD's summary of the Joint All-Domain Command and Control, uh, or JADC2 initiative, released in March of 2022. The figure titled in a homely spirit that, quote, JADC2 placemat, you should be able to see that in the caption there, um, was characterized by analysts from the Hudson Institute, a conservative think tank, as a, quote, graphic that was confusing even by Department of Defense standards, end quote. Confusing, perhaps, but also illuminating. Let's read it for intelligence in the absence of life. <coughs> we can start with the central panel, which you'll recognize as the familiar OODA loop operating again here as a cognitivist reduction of the warring bodies to a black box that enacts decision, taking input received through its sensors, processing that input, and producing output in the form of action. Each step in the cycle of decision is expanded into its associated components. So you have across these three sections, so we can start with what, um, what is it that sources the input 
which originates as data, you can see the zeros and the ones, um, streaming in from beyond the diagram's frame on the left. So the world again floats outside the frame uh, and information streams thoughtfully from left to right, channeled into a set of stacks, the general architecture of computing. In this case, the stacks correspond to the current domains of warfighting, uh, the, the domains of warfighting that are sorted into territories of air, land, sea, space, and cyber, which together comprise a set of interlocking and interoperable systems. These input sources are then funneled through the structuring filters of attributes, architectures, and interfaces to make uh, the result available Uh, the results of the data gathering apparatus accessible to decision, or more accurately, to the further machinery designed to make sense of the data through the intersections of predictive analytics, machine learning, and the always residually floating signifier AI. The aim of all this data processing is the generation of output to be implemented by, quotes, people, processes, and authorities, which is kind of an interesting list, um, composing the enactments of the JADC2 vision that joins together the 11 combat commands to manage the state actors out there floating um, on, the, on the right, um, the state actors who, uh, who are, who are posi whose positioning as threats provides the justifying grounds for the whole machinery. And then floating somewhat ambiguously below and between all of this is the warfighting network, figure it as a kind of cross between the iconic tank and the aspirational cloud, all joined together by the dotted lines of electronic transmission. And then finally, hovering along the bottom of the frame is the repository of doctrine, and at the top, the program's aim, that is, quote, the warfighting capability to sense make sense and act at all levels and phases of war across all domains and with partners to deliver information advantage at the speed of relevance. And there you have it. The pursuit of this phantasmatic vision has seen a building out of infrastructures of surveillance that have of course now outpaced the capacities of data analysis which is where the magical thinking of AI-enabled warfighting enters the picture. In April of 2017, the DOD announced plans for its flagship AI project, the Algorithmic Warfare Cross-Functional Team, codenamed Project Maven, and accompanied by this quite extraordinary logo, which I cannot explain to you, I'm sorry. <laughs> the announcement of Project Maven by then Deputy Secretary of Defense Robert Work, and we're gonna meet him again, asserted the urgent need to incorporate artificial intelligence and machine learning across DOD operations. Project Maven's aim more specifically, Work states in this memorandum, is, quote, to turn the enormous volume of data available to the DOD into actionable intelligence and insights at speed, end quote. The plan as work sets it out in this memo includes an initial project focused on the task of labeling data within full motion video images generated by US drone surveillance operations as a first step toward establishing the algorithms and computational infrastructures needed to automate, quotes, object detection, classification, and alerts in support of military operations. The media reports surrounding Project Maven overwhelmingly beg the question of just what those objects um, are and the criteria by which an object might be identified as an imminent threat. We're told that 38 categories were used by those who hand-labeled images to form the initial training data, including the object, quote, an ISIS pickup truck. This raises the question of the presumed self-evidence of objects, which it quickly became evident included persons, and the relation between systems for the categorization of decontextualized images of objects, in this case a truck, and the question of how objects are incorporated into complex and changing relations and associated practices. The initial project Maven contract with Google uh, as many of you may know, met with resistance in the tech community, 
summarized plainly by Eric Schmidt, former CEO of, of Google and Alphabet, in a keynote chat at the Center for a New American Securities Artificial Intelligence and Global Security Summit in November of 2017. So this is soon after the Maven announcement. Schmidt cited resistance to Project Maven among Google workers as, quote, a general concern of somehow the military industrial complex using their stuff to kill people incorrectly, end quote. Schmidt himself explains the problem of machine learning when applied to what he characterizes as the abnormal. So he says, but the other thing that's worth saying is that these algorithms, at least today, require a great deal of training data. And when I say a great deal, I mean like millions of entries into the matrices, billions of pieces of data. So the classic example, people would say, well, why can't you figure out terrorism? Well, the good news is terrorism is very rare. And I thank Eric for saying that, right? So it's much, much harder, if you will, to apply AI to that problem. Whereas trying to understand traffic, right, as an example of something that occurs every day is far, far easier because you have so much training data. And we could spend a lot of time taking this apart, and I'd be happy to do that <laughs> later on. So these reservations notwithstanding, in the same discussion, Schmidt cites Project Maven approvingly as a project that, quote, combines a lot of these very clever systems. And while the exact nature of the targets of analysis under development in the project remain, remains unclear, at least the imaginary of an apparatus for the recognition of a terrorist threat continues uh, to, to circulate. So as an indicative example, Fortune magazine in a 2019 article titled Three Ways AI is Making You Safer reported that, quote, Project Maven, the Pentagon's most high profile AI initiative, aims to use machine learning algorithms to identify terrorist targets from drone footage. In 2022, the Pentagon handed the MAVEN program to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, responsible for processing the US's vast intake of aerial surveillance. In an interview with the defense media outlet Breaking Defense, Vice Admiral Robert Sharp, outgoing NGA director, said the fusion of Project MAVEN with his agency's ongoing AI efforts will, quote, give us our millions of eyes to see the unseen, end quote. The program is moving slowly, but companies like Palantir and Google itself are back in the game. The leading justification for these systems has always been the promise of precision and accuracy in targeting in the name of adherence to international humanitarian law and the Geneva Conventions. In a public plenary in February of 2021, Robert Work, now co-chair with former Google Alphabet CEO Eric Schmidt of the National Security Commission on AI, offers this demonstration of moral reasoning. He says, quote, the biggest contributor to inadvertent engagements is target misidentification. Humans make mistakes all the time in battle. And the hypothesis is, to be proven, that artificial intelligence will improve target identification, which should improve and reduce the number of collateral damages, reduce the number of fratricides. So it is a moral imperative to at least pursue this hypothesis. So this hypothesis enacts a familiar move, as failures of humans become the justification for further automation. Combining magical thinking with a leap of faith, which is named here a hypothesis, the proposition is that automated systems will somehow transcend the limits of the very knowledge practices that must necessarily inform them. But we now have ample evidence that the automation of data, data analytics works to reproduce and amplify the classificatory schemas that inform the data set. And nowhere is this more treacherous than, it, than when the data set is made out of various proxy signals, profiles, and so-called patterns of life. Inspired by the use of predictive data analytics in the context of finance, marketing, and consumer behavior, a growing number of companies now offer technologies for pattern of life analysis. This image is ta taken from the website of Aptima, advertising its event detection algorithms in a promotional video. 
Defining life as change in images over time translates life worlds into phenomena nicely tuned to the capacities of computational analysis. Aptima's event detection builds on a discourse of situational awareness as attunement to anomalous shifts in what comprise a normal scenery of places, persons, and activities. The profound problems with this approach were documented in the footage provided by Chelsea Manning and released by WikiLeaks in 2010 under the title Collateral Murder. The footage has been analyzed extensively by Al Jazeera and by Shushen Tan in her film Permission to Engage. The incident occurred in New Baghdad, Iraq in July of 2007, when a series of events led to the killing of civilians, including Reuters cameraman Shma, uh, Saeed Shma, uh, who is pictured here um, just to the left of the crosshairs. The deaths included a man passing by in a van, and, and his camera was seen as, as, a, as a weapon. The deaths included a man passing by in a van who attempt, uh, subsequently attempted to save Shema's life and the man's small child who was a passenger in the van. We're seeing a view here through the sights of an Apache helicopter gunship patrolling the area at the time, charged with protecting friendly troops operating in the area. As the events unfolded, Schmas' camera was read as a weapon and the van as a militant rescue effort, and on that basis, the gunners were given permission to fire. The point here is that actual situations in which weapons are used are fraught with uncertainties. That these give rise to misrecognition on the part of human combatants could be and has been cited as the rationale for the automation of targeting. But if we look carefully at the circumstances surrounding these and many other documented incidents, it becomes clear that however tragically prone to misreading actual situations of contemporary irregular warfare might be, the premise that they could be specified algorithmically is indefensible. Close analysis of many other incidents by investigative journalists and the DOD itself makes clear that the problem of situational awareness in military operations is not a matter of inadequate sensor ne ne networks or access to information, but of the frames of war into which militarism subjects and objects are incorporated. Claims for the precision of US operations ha have now been further challenged in a series of articles published in 2021 in the New York Times by investigative journalist Asmat Khan, based on more than 1,300 credibility assessments from the US Department of Defense. These are reports of civilian casualties on the ground uh, to the DOD, um, obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. The reports cover allegations surrounding airstrikes that took place between September 2014 and January 2018, and Khan writes, what I saw after studying them was not a series of tragic errors, but a pattern of impunity, of a failure to detect civilians, to investigate on the ground, to identify causes and lessons learned, to discipline anyone or find wrongdoing that pr would prevent these recurring problems from happening again. It was a system that seemed to function almost by design to not only mask the true toll of American airstrikes, but also legitimize their expanded use. And along with the records, Khan's reporting is based on five years of on-the-ground investigations, uh, from which um, she concludes. On the ground, I found a pattern of life that was very different from the one that the military described in its credibility assessments, and documented death rates that vastly exceeded US Central Command's own numbers. I also came away with a grim understanding of how America's new high-tech air wars look to, a civilian, to civilians who live beneath it. People in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan trying to raise families, earn a living, and stay away from the fighting as best they can. As Gregoire Chamaillot pointed out a decade ago in his theory of the drone, the claims for precision that justify new investments in automated targeting systems are based on a systematic conflation of the relation between a weapon and its designated target on the one hand, and the identification of what constitutes a legitimate target on the other. 
No amount of improvement in the technologies of the first can address the uncertainties of the se second. And insisting that they can is part of a campaign to deny the increasing reliance of the military on ever more questionable forms of stereotypic categorization of what and who constitutes a legitimate threat. The apparatus that produces the difference friend-enemy operates within what Judith Butler names the frames of war that delineate the legitimate target along with the field of collateral damage. Butler writes, any effort to understand must consider how wars are waged and the technology of war, but to understand the operation of technology, we have to consider how it works on the field of the senses. What is formed and framed through the technological grasp and circulation of the visual and discursive dimensions of war. This grasping and circulation is already an interpretive maneuver, a way of giving an account of whose life is a life and whose life is effectively transformed into an instrument, a target, or a number, or is effaced with only a trace remaining or none at all. The horrors of this apparatus, and again, Elke referred to this this morning, have become clear with the reported application of machine learning to targeting by the IDF in Israel's ongoing assault on Gaza. In a series of investigative reports published in the Israeli-Palestinian outlets Plus 972 and Local Call, Israeli journalist Yuval Abraham has given us detailed accounts of two of the IDF's current systems named respectively Habsura, or the Gospel, and Lavender. The first report published in November of last year draws on sources within the Israeli intelligence community who confirm that IDF operations in the Gaza Strip combine more permissive authorization for the bombing of non-military targets with a loosening of constraints regarding expected civilian casualties. This policy sanctions the bombing of built structures in densely populated civilian areas, including high-rise res residential and public buildings designated as so-called power targets. Official legal guidelines require that selected buildings must house a legitimate military target and be empty at the time of their destruction. The latter has resulted in the IDF's issuance of a constant and changing succession of unfeasible evacua evacuation orders to those trapped in diminishingly small areas of Gaza. Moreover, once Israel declares the entire surface of Gaza as a cover for Hamas tunnels, all of which are assumed to be legitimate military targets, the entire strip becomes fair game for destruction. A direct corollary of this operational strategy is the need for an unbroken stream of candidate targets. To meet this requirement, Habsura is designed to accelerate the generation of targets from surveillance data, creating what one former intelligence officer who's quoted in the story's headline describes as, quote, a mass assassination factory. The second story published just a week ago describes the system named Lavender, dedicated to the targeting of individuals designated as suspected low-level Hamas or uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad militants. The training data were based on features correlated with, and these need to be constructed, of course, correlated with known Hamas or jihad fight fighters, which taken together comprise a deadly version of Jorge Luis Borges' fantastic zoology in the Book of Imer Imaginary Beings, including people who are in a WhatsApp group with an identified militant, people who get new cell phones every few months, or people who change their addresses frequently. All individuals in, in the population data set, which is built from the massive surveillance in infrastructure of the occupied territories, were then assigned a score from 1 to 100. Based on these scores, the system marked some 37,000 people as probable militants and potential targets. The machine-generated targets were given only cursory review. One source explained that he would spend roughly 20 seconds to confirm that the individual was male, given the prohibition with Hamas and the PIJ against women fighters. Abraham further describes a horrendous kind of cost-benefit calculus that plots the monetary value and availability of bombs against the rating of the target, resulting in the use of so-called dumb bombs against those categorized as low-level militants. Quote, 
you don't want to waste expensive bombs on unimportant people. It's very expensive for the country, and there's a shortage of those bombs. And that's a quote from C, one of the intelligence officers interviewed by Abraham. Moreover, to simplify the labor of tracking targets on the move, individuals were attacked not when they were in combat, but rather when they returned to their houses at night, with the result that entire families were killed along with the target, another clear violation of international humanitarian law. Most notably, the Israeli bombardment of Gaza has shifted the argument for AI-enabled targeting from claims to greater precision and accuracy to the objective of accelerating the rate of destruction. IDF spokesperson Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari has confirmed that in the bombing of Gaza, quote, the emphasis on, is on damage and not on accuracy, end quote. For those who have been advancing precision and accuracy as the high moral ground of data-driven targeting, this admission must surely be disruptive. It shifts the narrative from a technology in aid of adherence to international humanitarian law and the Geneva Conventions to automation in the name of industrial scale productivity in target generation, enabling greater speed and efficiency in killing. As the intelligence sources acknowledge, moreover, Israel's operations are not indiscriminate, but are deliberately designed to create shock among the civilian population under the premise that this will somehow contribute to Israel's aim of eliminating Hamas. Based on the e evidence from Gaza, where as I last uh, heard, civilian casualties have surpassed 33,000 and they're likely significantly higher, including over 13,000 children, the gospel of AI-enabled precision and accuracy has now been revealed as a pretext for the acceleration of unrestrained and criminal acts of genocide. And all of this occurs in a context of Israel's economic commitment to establishing itself as a leading purveyor of high-tech military technoscience, not least in so-called AI-enabled warfighting. The death machine currently operating in Gaza and that of the Holocaust are connected through the film zone of interest, a relation made explicit in direct, director Jonathan Glazer's much discussed acceptance speech for the, 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 when he received the award for best international film at the Academy of War, Awards last month. The film surveils the everyday domestic life of the Haas family, whose patriarch Rudolf is the commandant of the Auschwitz concentration camp just on the other side of the wall. The absent presences here are imminent as the towers of the camp and the smokestacks of its incinerators rise above the wall and the muted soundtrack, the grinding operations of an enormous machine punctuated by occasional cries of brutality or distress, creates what Glazer has described as a state of, quotes, ambient genocide. Apparently normalized into an unnoticed background for their lives, the family goes about their business in what seems a blissful ignorance. Only the commandant himself crosses into the public sphere of the workplace on the other side of the wall, absorbing its brutality into the unruffled countenance of a company man committed to the organization of Nazism and his advancement within it. That, and that's what enables the sustenance of his family's comfort. As Naomi Klein observes in a recent review of the film for The Guardian, the Haas family, quote, managed to, tur to turn profound evil into white noise. Glazer said in his acceptance speech, all our, quote, all our choices were made to reflect and confront us in the present, not to say, look at what they did then, rather, look at what we do now. Glazer called on Jews, I should say I'm a Jewish American, so I feel called. Uh, Glazer called on, calls on Jews to refute the weaponizing of the intergenerational trauma of the Holocaust in service of Israel's effective genocide in the occupied territories of Palestine. As Klein observes, more than five months into the daily slaughter in Gaza, and with, the is with Israel brazenly ignoring the orders of the International Court of Justice, and Western governments gently scolding Israel while shipping it more arms, genocide is becoming ambi ambient once more, at least for those of us fortunate enough to live on the safe sides of the many walls that carve up our world." End quote. 
I want to suggest then that we need to bring into focus the absent presences that haunt the worlds just on the other side of our walls, creating zones of disinterest for those benefiting from the comforts born of the historical violence of empire and settler colonialism and the enclosures and erasures on which white privilege and extractive capitalism continue to depend. Growing bodies of scholarship and, scholarship and activism are calling for reckonings with those ghosts and joinings in the transformative work at the openings, the cracks through which the light of inextinguishable liveliness gets in. Data can be a part of that work, but only in relation with that which enumeration in the service of containment renders outside of its zones of interest. Thanks. <laughs>